It's on. Okay, go Hi. ahead. Hi. Um, Jessica White, I am a, uh, a LaRouche, member of uh, LaRouche uh, PAC, and um, I'm so glad to see you again. I was at, at the uh, previous um, event in Harlem in October, and um, it's really wonderful to have you with us again this evening. Uh, what I'm wondering is, um, what would you say about uh, Obama's um, input or not a lack of lack thereof of trying to uh, reveal the 28 pages or help to uh, to fulfill his promise, which was actually a campaign promise of releasing the 28 pages. And um, you know, how do you? I know how I feel about it, but <laughs> right. You know. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. It was a campaign promise. I think he his during his campaign he promised transparency quite often. That's what he ran on. Yes. And if you're going to make that your, you know, when you go into office that you're going to be transparent, and we come to you and we ask you to please release these pages when. It, we've been told over and over again, there's no threat to national security. That's the biggest thing everyone should take away from this and why you should want them released is because they hold truths to who was behind 9-11, who financed 9-11, relationships that were going on between our country and Saudi Arabia. So the fact that Bush covered it up is, isn't, isn't the big surprise. The bigger surprise is that Obama has followed through with what Bush did and has not released them. We've written to him on three separate occasions, letters that he has not answered. So he just, he remains silent on it. That's really all I can tell you. I, I've never heard him, other than two times he met with family members since he took office. Um, one was in the very beginning in January, I believe, and he did tell them that then, I would, yeah, sure, I'll release the 28 pages. I'm not so sure he knew what the 28 pages were when he said it, to be honest with you. I don't know if he's ever read them. We've asked the question, have you ever read the 28 pages? We don't get that answered either. Um, and then another time he was down at Ground Zero after Osama bin Laden was taken out, and a family member asked him at that uh, ceremony, did will you please release the 28 pages? And he said, yeah, yeah, I, I can do sure. that. Yeah, yeah, we get the, oh yeah, sure. And then nothing happens. So that's, I, I, don't, I don't know any more than that other than he remains silent on it. Right. Well, as it was uh, mentioned, when good people do nothing, not that he's a good people, but, um, <laughs> right, know, right, evil happens when, has, when right. good men do nothing, evil right. prevails, right. right. And um, he's doing nothing. So evil will prevail. He is connected, and he continues the cover-up, and um, we continue our relationship with Saudi Arabia uh, on a level that is unconscionable, and uh, I think he knows what's in the 28 pages, and many of us here do. And right. he continues because he is just like Bush. Yes, in that respect, yes. And, and the reason you should call your congressperson, you should fight for them to read them and sign on to House Resolution 428 is because the foreign policy that we are following now is, is leading us in a very dangerous, down a very dangerous path. Right. And when those pages are released, it will give the American people the power to then speak out on what you want our foreign policy to be. We are kept in the dark right now, and we need to shed light on the truth. And that's the biggest reason why I fight for the 28 pages, is because I think we're headed down the wrong path, and I think releasing them will give the American people the knowledge that you deserve, the truth. It'll give the families the knowledge and the truth that we deserve, but our foreign policy, more importantly, will change. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Mr. Otter. Uh, this question is primarily for the people who are here and the people filming so that they can see your response. But uh, I know that during the September 9th uh, press conference in Washington, Congressman Jones referenced, just as an aside, that these 28 pages are in a guarded room. Could, could you speak to that? For the benefit of the people okay. who say government can't keep secrets, that they are keeping right. secrets and that they're keeping secrets that are guarded. 
24 yes. hours a day. I'm not, they're below the Pentagon. You, you go very deep into the bowels of the Pentagon, and they are in a vault. And yes, it's a heavily guarded vault. And when they ask for permission to read the 28 pages, it's, it's not an easy process. They have to uh, ask for them more than once. And when they finally get a permission, like they said, they're taken down to this vault, and they're not allowed to bring a pen or paper. They can, and, and they're guarded, and they can only read them and take it as way as much as they can. And luckily for us, these are smart congressmen going down to read them, so they can retain information that they read. Um, and then they are shocked at what they see. And so that's the biggest thing. If you can get more people to read them, I, I don't know one person yet that's read them that has said, well, I wouldn't want these released. Every single person that's read them says, oh, yeah, we should know what's in them. Has any of the congressmen that you, that you have personally spoken to alluded to what kind of penalties they would face? And I know Walter Jones just mentioned as an aside, we can't tell you what we just read because we'd face serious consequences, but have they ever spelled out to you personally what those serious consequences would be if they were to tell you or tell us on camera what those um, some of the contents of those documents? No, but Mr. McGovern might understand that. I mean, they're, they're highly classified documents. They are sworn to uphold their promise that they would not speak on them publicly. They can speak amongst other Congress people, but not publicly. Okay. So what their penalties would be, I don't know what happens if you talk about a classified document. Okay. But something pretty strong, or they'd all be <laughs> letting out more than they are. Yeah, I'm really con conflicted about that, because you know they say no one would risk, if someone knew something, they would say something. Like here in New York, you see on the subways all the time, if you see something, say something. So well, they've said enough for us to get you know, they've given us just enough information to, to want us to say we want to know everything. The, the little bit that they've told us or that they've allowed us to understand is that the Saudis were involved in the financing and the arrangements of the 19 hijackers in this country. You have to remember they were here for two, almost two years living amongst us. They, they were being funded by someone. And in these 28 pages, it's about the relationships of the Saudi, you know, members, some members of the Saudi government, not everyone, um, and the royal family, they're one and the same, giving the funds necessary for those 19 hijackers to live here and take the flying lessons, have their apartments, you know, driver's licenses, you know, the, the, you have to remember, terrorists aren't, they don't go to work, they don't get a paycheck, so they have to be funded somehow. And the biggest problem, or the biggest horrifying thing about not knowing what happened after 9-11 and knowing what's in these 28 pages is we didn't go after the right people. We didn't go after Saudi Arabia. We didn't go after the ones that were funding Al-Qaeda. So therefore now we are faced with ISIS. And I've heard Senator Graham draw a direct correlation if we had, you know, hindsight's whatever. But if we had known and did more after 9-11, there's a, we wouldn't have the trouble or the problems that we have now with ISIS, which are terrifying. Probably. I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah, you want to answer the classified what happened? This issue is, is very alive now because the Senate Intelligence Committee report on CIA torture, five years and $40 million in the making, has been completed, and there's a kind of a kabuki dance going on between President Obama Diane Feinstein, head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and John Brennan, uh, head, head of the CIA. Um, Brennan redacts it to a fairly well, gives it to Feinstein. She says, oh, that doesn't make any sense now. She complains to the president. She gives it to the president. The president gives it back to John Brennan, and it goes on and on. Obviously, during the last year, they've been waiting for the Senate to change hands and don't hold your breath, folks, for anything being related to what the CIA did for torture, partly because the president is afraid of the CIA. I'll say that again. The president is afraid of the CIA, has just as he's afraid of the generals, to whom he's just given in on Afghanistan again. We're going to have another war, or a war for another year there now, if you saw the New York Times this morning. So, can, can a, a senator or a representative get up and divulge this kind of information? The answer is yes. And 
the issue right now with respect to the Senate Intelligence Committee report on torture is whether Mark Udall, senator from Colorado who lost his post in the last election, whether he will have the guts to stand up and read into the record the summary or whatever he wants of the Senate Intelligence Report on CIA torture. He can do that. He has the constitutional prerogative to do that without any risk. He has immunity to do that. Now, we're trying to encourage him to do precisely that. Did this ever happen before? Yeah, it did. It did. <laughs> when Daniel Ellsberg, with the Pentagon Papers, those younger of you have to read up on this, but when he wanted it read into the congressional record, Mike Gravel from, uh, from Alaska convened his committee of one on the House Means and the House uh, Park Hedges and Lawn Committee, and he read it as far as he could into the record, and then he said the rest of it goes into the record. He did that because he had immunity. It got into the congressional record, and ipso facto was declassified. So there's precedent for it, but there's the club, you know? And Mark Udall is one of the good guys, but he's part of the establishment. And so you have to write him a letter, folks. You have to write him a letter and say, look, you don't have any risk for doing this. All your risk is not being able to get a massage in the house, uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, pool. Uh, getting kicked out of the Chevy Chase Country Club. Uh, the establishment might not invite you to some of their uh, dinners and stuff. That's all. That's all you risk. So, Mark, with all due respect, you can do the right thing, do it. The same thing. The same thing could happen with respect to 9-11. I don't know if anybody has uh, told Walter Jones, who I have great admiration for, would you be willing to do that, Walter? But it's time that we did ask Walter Jones precisely that. Let me, let me just add one other thing on this also. Um, the Obama administration has carried out more prosecutions of uh, federal government whistleblowers under the Espionage Act than all previous presidencies combined. So, uh, and th this is not on the basis that current or former intelligence people went to some hostile foreign government and provided state secrets. This was on the basis that people came forward and said, the public has the right to know when the government commits crimes. And there are laws on the books that supposedly protect whistleblowers, but this administration, this Justice Department, has basically gone ruthlessly with prosecutions under the Espionage Act that has nothing to do with legitimate whistleblowing to journalists to get at the truth that the government is covering up because they're concealing criminal activity. So that's, when people say that's what they're afraid of, that is part of the picture that they're frightened of, but what Ray just said is 100% accurate. It's the little step-by-step -step surrenders to a certain climate of terror that has led us to the point that we're at right now. Now, uh, one other thing to just say on the 28 pages. Um, Congressman Jones and the others who are involved in this fight uh, have a sense that we can win. They have a sense that there is momentum building on this issue. And as Terry said, every single member of Congress who's gone in and read the 28 pages has come to the identical conclusion, number one, that these are monumental disclosures that are terribly embarrassing, that have profound strategic implications, but in no case do they jeopardize national security. Now, 28 pages in a government report, you can get a lot of stuff in. We know because Senator Graham wrote a book in 2004 called Intelligence Matters 
a good deal about part of what's in those 28 pages. He recounted anecdotally how he found out about Prince Bandar and his wife, Princess Haifa, financing the San Diego hijackers through two Saudi intelligence officers who were the minders of those two first terrorists to arrive in the United States. In his book, he also recounts the fact that the two initial terrorists in San Diego rented rooms in the home of another Saudi who happened to be an FBI informant. So the FBI in San Diego literally was sitting on the two lead hijackers. There's all kinds of embarrassing things in there. But all of that material could probably be summarized and written up in some detail in maybe five or ten pages. There are clearly a lot of other things in that chapter because when Congressman Massey said, this changed my thinking about everything that has gone on for the past dozen years, he wasn't kidding. In private conversations, uh, Congressman Jones has said very similar things. It raises profound implications about our government and the way we deal with certain countries that are treated as allies but should never be treated as allies. So it's, it's the McCarthyite climate of terrorism and fear that is what's going on here, not the specific punishment. Because in a certain sense, winning this fight for the 28 pages is really a, a fight for the soul of this country. It really comes down to that. It's not the only fight for the soul of this country, but it is a very important fight, and we're within striking distance of winning. So that's, I think, a little bit more on, on where, where this fight stands and what, what Congressman Jones and others mean when they say that they feel that there's a tremendous threat. People have, people have died under mysterious circumstances in order to silence them from the kind of truth that they know if they're willing to fight for it. So this is a real life and death battle that we're dealing with here, and it's not a matter of just the historical record or even our ability to fight more effectively against ISIS down the road. This is all about the soul of the United States, which has been basically destroyed and has to be recaptured again. So Les, can you come to the microphone? This is Les Jameson, who is a co-conspirator and who was central to the organizing of this meeting. Les? Thank you. Thank you all. We have great knowledge today. We have great testimony. Now we have great opportunity to take action take the next step. And you'll be glad to hear, it's very simple, very easy to do. Anybody can pick up a phone, make a phone call to their legislators. I mean, because what we're all here to do, basically, is get political action, to let our representatives know that what we're after is truth, what we're after is justice, accountability, everything that anybody here can imagine as the most uh, important accomplishments, and this time, uh, as a tribute to the, uh, the JFK assassination and all the history of it, all the principles embodied therein, right up through 9-11. Until now, this is what is available to us by supporting HR 428. It's a very simple website to remember, hr428.org, also 28 pages Org. There are sample letters there. Matter of fact, on hr428.org, there's even an automated function. We'll do it for you. Just fill in the, the info. And what we need to do, folks, is become a political force, become a political constituency that those in Congress are very clear exists. That's it. And uh, like, again, 
is a great opportunity. Um, so what we would ask you to do is go to either of those two websites and going forward, we're looking to not only set up uh, conferences, meetings with the, uh, representatives, but if, uh, say, number one, we want you to read the 28 pages. That is significant. And once they do, we want them to co-sponsor the legislation. There are currently 20 co-sponsors. In January, there's going to be a few less because of some that who are leaving. Um, now, here's the goal, though. Next summer, I believe it's in June, the Patriot Act expires. Am I right? The Patriot Act is going to expire in June. Remember, this was passed six weeks after 9-11 with hardly anyone reading it. Something like 600 pages. Very suspect in and of itself. Okay, so imagine millions of people making noise between now and, nine, uh, now and next June saying, wait a minute, release those 28 pages because maybe that Patriot Act and the NDAA and the Military Commissions Act were not based on truth and fact. Can you imagine? And here's what else we have to work with, folks. Tom King is on record supporting the release of the 28 pages. The COMIC commissioners, the co-chairman of the 9-11 Commission, Keenan and Hamilton are both on record also saying they're very embarrassed that this still remains classified. And also, Tom Keene is on record saying he doesn't think anything should have been classified. Which means the testimony of William Rodriguez and Sibel Edmonds should be released. And whatever else is there. So there's an awful lot that is available. And uh, I hope that this event serves as a catalyst for this to in continue and build and grow. Thank you. I could be very brief with these comments. Yeah, but, uh, let me just say it's 554, so please be quick. Please okay. finish at 6. Yeah. There were some film people who went down and interviewed people who were at the Pentagon on the day of 9-11. They talked with all these federal people, people working at the Pentagon and everything like that. And they said no plane hit the building. <laughs> plane flew over the building, but it did not hit it. And these were people who were in military police uniforms, people who were in police uniforms. They were there on the day of 9-11. They said no plane hit the building. The other thing is 9-11 Eyewitness Hoboken was a video done by Rick Siegel. He happened to go out on Hoboken Pier because he worked in the World Trade Center and he had his camera, his video camera there. And he showed, after the first plane hit, he went and got the camera, all the demolitions going off at the bottom of the building that sounded like thunder. Uh, Rick Siegel um, was a guy who worked in the World Trade Center. He did a video, 9-11 Eyewitness Hoboken. And after the first plane hit, he was on Hoboken Pier, he ran back and got his video camera, and he put it on the pier at Hoboken, and he just started videoing. And you could see at least two demolitions go off at the bottom of the building that sounded like thunder over downtown Manhattan. I'm not sure if those were the demolitions that measured 2.3 and 2.1 on the Richter scale, measured by Cornell University in the state of New York, but there were some demolition charges in there. Maybe the hijackers somehow had some other accomplices that put demolition charges in the buildings, but it wasn't the planes alone that brought those buildings down, including Building 7, which was never hit by an airplane. So there's some real inconsistencies about some of the things that I've heard today. And what a lot of 9-11 Truth has known a lot about with demolition charges, no plane hit the Pentagon. Barry Zwicker did a very thorough documentary on that. Uh, I'll just take this up, because I don't know if other people heard it, and we sort of can summarize. The truth or falsehood of the various perceptions, uh, evidentiarily based or not, people of 9-11 or various other incidents, uh, is beside the point. Not because it's beside the point, because it may not be true, but because the issue of perception is beside the point. Where we are today in America, and this is sort of our summary here, we started and we concluded with Mr. Gallagher's presentation. Uh, because on this anniversary of 9-11, or rather of the Kennedy assassination, um, it's important for us to 
focus on immortality, not mortality. And the immortality of what we can do, as we try to express in the Requiem, is that we can celebrate the reasons for the assassinations. What I'd like everybody to do is to talk with Les and talk to others about what they wish to do, visit the literature table and uh, get the uh, material. By the way, there is a petition in the back on the United States joining the BRICS nations. The U.S. and Europe must have the courage to reject geopolitics and collaborate with the BRICS. I think this was already being circulated earlier. Um, and uh, there will be another conference, a Schiller Institute conference, on December 13th, place and time to be announced. Uh, you can get more information on that in the back. So I'd like to thank you all for coming. If there are other questions as we clear out, you're free to approach the speakers and ask them, and we'll see you next time.